Enshrouded Update 4, Souls of the Frozen Frontier is out now and it's a huge one. Let's look at this update trailer and then we are going to get into the nitty gritty. First up, the Albany Summits, a massive new snow biome that towers above the world as the highest peak on the map. This frozen landscape is home to breathtaking vistas, daunting peaks Amazing. and new settlements that tell the story of the ancient civilization that once lived here. The Albany summits bring with them fresh new challenges as new enemies and fauna parts. await. This biome transfers the way you approach combat and survival. Its frozen beauty is more than just a visual change. It deeply impacts gameplay making every decision in its harsh environment critical. Along with the Albany Summit, so we're introducing a completely new weather system. This dynamic system brings the world to life with changing weather throughout the day. But it's not just the snow. Rainstorm sweeps across the regions of Ambervale, adding to the immersion and making the world feel more alive than ever before. This new weather system is also going to allow them to make the adjustments to the lighting that we were hoping for, so it won't be so abrupt. Speaking of bringing the world to life, let's talk about the new threats you'll face. We are introducing new scavenger enemies with fire focused attacks from the flamethrower scavenger and the whip wielding champion. That's Not scary. Only attacks, but blast allies. You will also encounter a reach. new variation of the foe you already know, the Cyclops. This massive male brute roams caves and his corrupted version can be found in the Shroud, Ugh. ready to challenge even scary. the most seasoned players. Speaking of Shroud, keep an eye on the new Fogger Spawhead Mage. And of course, we've added new wildlife and their new variations, including the Mountain Yak, Snow it. Leopard, and the Mountain Goat. I wonder if they're going to be hard to get home. Now, let's move on to a complete revamp of NPCs. Your crafting NPCs can now roam freely around your base, following daily routines. Look at at night, they will seek out beds you assign them to sleep in. I wonder if they so can you open can doors. Create dedicated living quarters for your survivors. Their happiness is now tied to having a sheltered bed, so be sure to take care of their needs. After all, they're walking for free. We have the sections here now of craftspeople, assistants, and villagers for all the different types of people that we can have. Nine villagers, it shows. We've also introduced assistant crafting NPCs who can be found throughout the world and be placed in secondary bases, giving you access to crafting recipes without having to move your main NPCs. Nice. But that is not all. We are also introducing townsfolk to make your bases feel more alive. These NPCs can be found and rescued around the world and come with quests, dialogue, and interactions. And Shrouded is about restoring a kingdom, and these are your, um, first subjects. And now, let's talk about something you have been all asking for. We'll see what all the townspeople can, can do as well. You can and capture wildlife, bring them back to your base. Once there, they will produce resources like wool, milk, eggs, and feathers, as long as they are fed and sheltered. Animals can breed and produce offspring. And yes, you can even pet the baby animals. Even the babies. Nice. Pets are also making their way into your base. Cats and dogs can now be tamed, roaming freely in your settlement. They don't provide resources, but will give you buffs when petted. And with five coats for Perfect. dogs and cats, there's a good chance your pet in-game will look like your pets in real life. Moving on to miscellaneous stuff. We're increasing the max player level to 35, and the flame can be upgraded twice to help you venture into the new deadly shroud zones. You will also be able to there. unlock new weapons, new armor sets, and a reward glider system. And also, ice as a terrain block, which will let you have fun sliding across so frozen much surfaces fun. and perhaps put you on a collision course. The grappling hook has also been enhanced. It can now pull flying enemies towards you or launch you into the combat against larger foes. In order to use the new grappling hook mechanic, you will have to unlock it in the skill tree. I'm glad I saved some skill Finally, points. We've added new building materials and furniture to keep your creative side busy. From polished granite and obsidian to icy terrains and luxurious furniture sets. Look at that your tapestry and bed. Have never been greater. Oh my gosh. But wait, there is more. Of course there is. Like, actually, a lot more. Too much to cover here, so check the full patch notes linked in the description. We hope you enjoyed everything that Update 4 has to offer. From the Albany summits to the dynamic weather and bustling townsfolk, this update is about making the world of Enshrouded bigger and livelier than ever before. 
On that note, we'll see you in the next one. Let's dig into the good stuff. The new playable area is called the Albanese Summits, and it's going to be accessible through either one of the gates that we thought might be the entry points before. In the Nomad Highlands or the Kendall Wastes. Along with all of the new things, we're going to be able to glide through new aerial updrafts for added height and extended flights. That's going to make it interesting, and I wonder if this is something that's heading towards us being able to use updrafts to get to floating islands and POIs in the sky. Currently, if you don't want to deal with updrafts, they have added a setting so that you can turn updrafts off and just float along. There's a powerful creature rumored to haunt the highest peaks, so that's going to be the boss in the mountains, obviously. New shroud routes and new lore with new quests and exclusive achievements. The level cap has been increased to 35. We're going to have new resources up there, including the building blocks, the animals, and silver to mine. We'll be getting new crafting stations to be able to make the higher tier items. And every class has new items to go with them, including skills and perks. The dynamic weather system is now in place and it's going to change the weather across the world. So it's not like if it's raining in one part of the world, it's raining everywhere. I think it's going to depend on where you're at. And there is going to be a limit to how long, even as a flame born, you can stay in freezing temperatures. It will slowly start reducing your body heat. So we'll be getting recipes and armors, special foods to help us survive the cold. Campfires will help and also torches provide some additional warmth. The flame has brought more souls back to life. We're going to be able to discover townsfolk across Embervale, unlock their quests, and bring them home to join our settlement. We'll have assistance for all of the roles, like a blacksmith, that we can put in secondary bases so that we can have full crafting functionality in multiple settlements around the world. Townsfolk wander around, sleep in beds at night, and they engage with us more. And based on the townsfolk clothing, we're also getting fresh cosmetic items. Farm animals and pets are here. Non-hostile animals can now be tamed and brought home to produce valuable resources, provide you give them food and shelter. That sounds like any of the non-hostile animals in the world. When they're taken care of, they will breed and our flock can grow. We can find and tame pets such as cats and dogs, and when we pet them, they don't give us a resource, but they will give us a happiness buff. Quite a few visual updates. They've made quite a few changes to sky rendering so that the skies and lighting will seem more realistic, including the atmosphere and the clouds. And this is supposed to fix the dramatic color changes that happen during the sky day and night transition. Noticeable gameplay changes, including the grappling hook. Being able to pull airborne enemies to us or close the distance to large enemies. There is a skill on the skill tree that we need to use to unlock this ability. It's in the center of the circle, so you don't have to work your way out to get to it. You can now pause the game in single player mode and the text size can now be adjusted in the UI, which is nice. Our level cap is now raised to 35 and enemies in the new region are gonna start at level 28. We already mentioned that there's gonna be coldness in the mountains, but high altitudes will have more extreme coldness and we can follow the quest to discover the crafting materials and clothes and food and other methods for keeping warm. Just bringing a torch already helps a little bit. I think that's a really nice touch. Torches are usually just cosmetic or for lighting and it makes sense they would have a little warmth, they're fire. They have also added in a slider for the amount of body heat a player naturally has. I really like how they're making everything so customizable if people wanna play a specific way. There's a new tier of weapons out in the world for every weapon type and at several rarity levels. Epic versions of musical instruments can now be found in the world with increased effect. Be interesting to see what that means with increased effect. Several new consumables and throwables are available to make exploration easier or help in combat. The skill tree now has two new skills that when unlocked, allow us to use the grappling hook during combat. I was curious whether this was gonna be a different kind of grappling hook, but it's not. It's the one you've already made. 
You just need the skill to use it this way. There's a new gameplay element so that certain enemy projectiles can now be parried and redirected back toward the enemy. I love it. It's like in Valheim when they throw a stone at you and you want to throw it back. <laughs> now you can parry things back at them. The damage for the merciless attack is now higher when using daggers. We mentioned the aerial turbulence, so on occasion we may need to readjust our flight paths. This is a very interesting one. I'm going to read this word for word. The cost for resetting the skill tree is now calculated based on the number of previously spent skill points. Each spent skill point costs one rune. Please note, the number of available skill points after the reset is determined by the progress of the character, which means the character level plus the number of destroyed shroud roots. When resetting the skill tree with old character saves for the first time, there can be a difference between previously spent skill points and what is available after the reset. This is the result of previous tweaks to the costs of individual skills. So first of all, this is showing the distinction of having character-based games on a server rather than server-based. And also if you've saved up a few extra skill points to have for the update, like I did, not knowing what was coming, what you actually have on hand may be adjusted. They've also changed the curve for the XP that's needed for leveling up. They thought that before it started at a pretty good range, but by the time you got to the Rebel Winds, that people were kind of getting to a high level too quickly when they got into the Kindle Wastes. So the new leveling up curve should spread it out a little bit more. And they're going to monitor the feedback on this and see what people's impressions are. And they'll make changes if needed. So I think that this is probably going to make later biomes a little bit more difficult. I think some people initially were saying that it was a bit too easy. You were a bit OP. Of course, again, if you want an easy gameplay and focus on building or something like that, you can always adjust these things in the sliders and the settings. They fixed some ranged combat issues relating to duration of speeds and arrows. Apparently, speedrunners aren't going to be able to spam things anymore to get that advantage. They've improved prioritization of the grappling hook target. So when an anchor is directly targeted, it'll now be prioritized higher. So hopefully that'll make it easier for us to jump up to the specific place we're trying to get to. When dying from poison, you're not still being poisoned after you respawn. However, the item Clean Bandage no longer removes poison. Instead, there's a new dedicated antidote that can be unlocked by collecting poison sacks. And later on, there's also an improved version of the antidote item. So in the game world and enemies, in the new Albany summits, we're going to have around 100 new points of interest to discover. The quest leading us into this region is unlocked when the flame is at level 6 and the ghost glider has been obtained. There's one new elixir well and six new locations with shroud roots to gain skill points. More than 20 new and updated enemy types. We have a new boss in the mountains. A quest will guide players through the steps to summon the new creature. So it's not just going to appear. You have to actually summon it in. It says to bring your best gear and maybe friends. So this one's going to be tough. We have a new set of trees and plants to get new resources from. In the new weather system, as things change between rain or snow, wetness does give a slight debuff to players and it affects the surroundings. For example, it'll extinguish small fires. Also, during the rain, it's easier to sneak into enemy camps because the enemy perception is reduced. That's interesting. It's like they can't hear you as well over the rain. How realistic. The frequency of unpleasant weather phenomena can be adjusted in your difficulty settings. The models for sage and indigo plants have been adjusted so that it's easier to tell them apart. I appreciate that because I would have to pick them sometimes to figure out which was which. There are four new songs that can be discovered. If you've previously found snow patches in the mountains surrounding the Springlands and Rebel Woods, those have been moved to higher altitudes. It's funny, they say climate change is caused by people, but in this case in particular, it's level designers who are responsible. We'll blame them. And then they have lots of little fixes and improvements to things around the world, of course. Moving on to villagers, farm animals, and pets. All seven of the crafting NPCs now have a day and night cycle, so they'll go around and explore the base, inspect interesting locations, take breaks, 
talk to nearby players, go to sleep at night, either on the floor if the player decided to not provide a bed for them. A disturbing number of you, they say. <laughs> I, guess, I mean, I got beds for most of them. I'm working on it. But you can assign them to a dedicated bed. Crafting assistants have been added to the game. When they're found and unlocked in the game, they can be placed in secondary player bases, offering the same crafting options as the main NPC. Townsfolk villagers are added. Similarly, they'll roam around the base, offering dialogue options, new quests, and follow a simple day and night cycle. Freed villagers will offer more knowledge about the world and give us numerous more quests. As a reward for us helping them out, they will help us find more villager souls, help us find lost pets to bring home, uncover vanity items, and collectibles to decorate our house. I'm still hoping that at some point they're going to be doing more tasks for us. I think that may be a future point still. The summoning scepter has been adjusted to be reworked for all these new NPCs, including offering the option to set the roaming range for the placed NPCs. I was wondering how they're going to do that in a voxel-based world. So you can let them roam far and wide if it works in your area, or you can tell them to stay in a specific place. And it's also used to assign a selected NPC to a highlighted bed. Sheltering for our NPCs has been we worked before it would look to see if they had roofs and walls around them, and now the location of the assigned bed checks for roof and walls. There are six different peaceful wildlife animals that can be tamed and brought home. For every type of farm animal, there's a craftable food and bait. For more information on this, we need to talk to Emily Frey, the farmer, which makes sense. There are also sleeping and feeding props that can be crafted with Emily. These feeding props have inventories that only accept the designated food items for that animal type. When the animal's hungry and can reach the filled prop, it'll automatically take food from the stack. And then the farm animals will produce different types of resources at regular intervals as long as they find food and shelter when they need it. When two of our farm animals of the same kind are within reach of other are within reach of each other, there's a chance that they will have an offspring. Both parents need to have access to food and shelter, and a free bed must exist for the offspring. Only one offspring can be born per night in each player base, even if several parent animals fulfill the preconditions. And of course, animals can be petted. It makes your character feel warm and fuzzy inside. Eight new pets have been added, including five dogs and three cats. Quests can lead the player to where you can find them in Embervale. Once they're tamed, they can be picked up and placed in a player base where they'll roam around and let themselves be petted to give you that buff. And of course, there's a taming difficulty setting for the game world. Now that villagers and animals are moving around the base, they say that if one of them has trouble navigating around, it can help to place them again at a different position. And it would be best for some villagers to not leave their designated space. So you might want to adjust the roaming distance. It can even be set to zero for each NPC individually if you want them to stay in a specific spot. Crafting, building, and terraforming. There's a new crafting tier with completely new resources for mining, harvesting, looting, several new crafting stations, nine new sets of armor available for crafting, six new building block materials, and five new terrain materials for building and terraforming. And terraforming. Five new terrain materials, that's a lot. Numerous new furniture and decorative props that can be crafted with the new materials from the new biome. Numerous props that we couldn't craft before are now available at crafting stations, including new crates, boxes, sacks, carts, farming tools, archery props, and combat dummies. King size beds now have two slots for sleeping. And building with materials from the shroud no longer triggers that weird ambient sound in the player base. Thank you. I don't want my base creeped out. Fireworks have been added to the list of craftable recipes. And thank goodness the fossil collection shelves no longer need the ectoplasm block as a crafting resource. The resource has been replaced with cloth. That was a very expensive shelf. They now have some little corrections and tweaks in how things are built with the right materials. Little issues with hair, how hair, hats, and helmets look. Technical improvements. I'm not going to go over every single detail in these. The highlights are basically that they've done a lot to increase shaders, lighting, atmospherics. Clouds are more realistic. Sunlight, shadows. The day and night cycle rendering is better. Bloom has been reduced. Also, 
Players now leave traces in the snow. They have added a new voxel compression method, and this leads to smaller installation files and using less disk space, which is nice. For the UI inventory and text, you can now open the escape menu when the character has fallen or while fast traveling. They've improved map markers by focusing more on quest markers and waypoints over optional markers when you're zooming out on the map and tweak the color palette of markers. I don't see it saying that we can name individual markers yet. Hmm. They've created a clickable overlay on the world map for waypoints that are outside the current view area. They fixed an issue that prevented you from picking up loot when all your slots in your backpack were full, but the picked up loot would still fit in a non-filled stack, so it will stack on the same item. So did you get what you were hoping for? Is there something missing from this list that you really were hoping would be here? I'm looking forward to digging into all the details of this exploring and getting more information out. Make sure to like and subscribe for more Enshrouded. Until next time, happy gaming.